Hello and welcome to this edition of DECast. My name is Rob Bagby. I'm a developer evangelist for Microsoft Corporation. And this is the fourth in a multi-part series of screencasts I'm doing illustrating the interop opportunities available to PHP developers on the Microsoft platform. Specifically in part one and part two of this screencast, I'm going to illustrate how you can take advantage of Windows Azure Table Storage. Now if you're not familiar with what Azure Table Storage is, it's, uh, to put it kind of simply, it's a, a non-relational storage system in the cloud that offers you massive scalability and high availability. So in order to kind of understand how that works, it's probably best to talk about how, the, how Azure Table Storage is structured. So when you sign up for Windows Azure uh, and, and Table Storage, you, you receive this storage account. And the storage account can store you know, zero or more tables. These tables aren't tables as you think of them in the traditional sense. They're not, uh, they're not the rows and columns uh, table that you're used to. These tables actually store uh, what I refer to as property bags. They store these things that are entities, and each entity contains uh, three or more properties. Uh, these properties are just simply name value pairs that are typed. And so when I say three or more properties, what I'm, uh, that wasn't a mistake. When you add a, an entity or create an entity for Azure Table Storage, we force you to, to provide three specific properties, um, a partition key, and a row key, and a timestamp. And the partition key is, is by far the most important, and that's, um, that's how we are able to offer you this massive scalability. So if you're familiar with the concept of database sharding, you'll be really familiar with how Azure Table Storage works. The way we offer scalability is we are able to move data across varying nodes inside of these data centers. And in order to do that, we have to provide you a mechanism to tell us which data needs to stay together, which data needs to get queried together. And you do that through the partition key. So if you added all of your entities in with the same partition key, you wouldn't be able to, to scale beyond one node. However, if you choose a, a viable partition key and allow us to move this data across these varying nodes, you're going to get that massive scalability where you can store millions, if not billions and trillions of, of, of records inside of these data centers without having to build out all of that infrastructure yourself. The next question that kind of comes up is, well, that's cool, but how do I access Azure Table Storage? How can I, how can I do that? Well, we expose a RESTful API. And so you may be wondering to yourself, well, you know, what, what's REST? If you're not familiar with, with what REST is, I'm going to do the 50,000 foot view here. It's essentially just an architectural style that essentially embraces the standard protocols of the web, like HTTP and, and URI. So some key facets are you, tr you treat everything as a resource, and, and each resource has its own unique URI. So similar to how, uh, how most of the web works, most of the pages are, are resources, and they have their own unique URI. Um, you use the appropriate HTTP verbs for the appropriate action. So if you want to fetch something, you issue a get to that URI. If you want to delete that resource, you issue a delete to that URI, and so on. There's also this concept of standard representation formats. Obviously, on the, on the browsable web, the standard representation format is HTML. Um, from the, from the services web, represent standard representation formats are, are Atom formatted XML or XHTML or micro formats, which are subsets of, of XHTML or, or, or even JSON. And sometimes uh, uh, some people, it's not such a standard representation format, but some folks use, use POX, plain old XML. An, another facet is the, the appropriate use of HTTP headers, such as HTTP status codes or, as we'll see later, uh, authorization headers. The next question that comes about is, you know, how does authorization work? Well, when you sign up for Azure Table Storage and you get your account, you also get this key that you use. And use that key to sign, sign your messages. So you create a message to sign, you digitally sign that message, and then you pass that as an authorization header uh, with your message. It's, it's actually uh, quite simple. Some other notables, uh, inside of Azure Table Storage, we've actually, uh, we actually, our standard representation format is Atom. And uh, we do use uh, HTTP verbs appropriately, and uh, and we we pass the appropriate status code, so you you know know if you got a 200, everything worked out uh, just fine. 404, you weren't able to find that uh, find that resource, etc. It's probably easiest for me to show you how to issue a a restful call to uh, to Azure Table Storage. Now, before I do that, I do want to note that uh, what you're going to see here kind of looks like quite a bit of work. And, and, and in some cases, it, 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 it's, it's not complex, but it's a little bit of work that 
we've actually, uh, as we're going to see uh, in, in in part two and then a future screencast, we've we've taken great ends to alleviate the the amount of effort it, it it requires to access Azure Table Storage. So, with that, let me just show you. If it, hopefully, you're familiar with a tool called Fiddler, and Fiddler has a, a really nice uh, nice capability. It's called the Request Builder, and it allows you to essentially uh, add a URI and any HTTP headers, and then issue the appropriate HTTP verb, and and you'll get uh, you'll get a response back, and then we can take a look at what that request looks like and what the response looks like. So we're going to use that. Now I have this uh, I have this little tool that I wrote to sh illustrate how we can build out the appropriate URI and appropriate HTTP headers. So what you'll see here, let me just let me just run this thing up again just to show you from from the start. Um, what what we have here is just some source data. You can see that I've got just the date and uh, this is my account name that when I signed up for Azure uh, this is the shared key or the private key excuse me they gave me and then here is my table name wines that's what I'm going to be trying to fetch data from Now, when I click get sign string I'm walking through a little process that I'm going to kind of describe to you the first thing I do is I create the URI and what we do is we take the base Azure table storage URI which is table.core.windows.net and we prepend your account name to it so it's http colon account name dot table dot core dot windows dot net and then we append the table name, whack wine. So this is going to be the URI that I want to issue a get to. So I'm going to open up Fiddler again. I'm going to put that in my URI. We've already got it set up for a get. Let's go back here. The next thing we did was I took this date and I formatted it as a GMT date. And then I just went ahead and created this message that I want to sign, which is the uh, GMT date and then an end of line character and then slash account name slash table name. And then I digitally sign that. You'll see that code in part two of this screencast. You'll actually see the PHP code I'm using to do that. But I'm essentially signing it with this key. Okay, And so I get this signed message. Then I essentially create some HTTP headers, including the authorization header, which is shared key light space my account name colon, and then that signed message. And then we've got the date, the uh, what I'm accepting, my application Atom, uh, Atom formatted XML, and then a UTF-8 uh, character set. So I'm just going to copy this or these HTTP headers here. I'm going to go ahead and paste those right there. I'm going to clear this and I'm just going to click execute and issue my get to, uh, to Azure Table Storage. Now you can see over here that, um, let me just scoot this over, you can see that we had an HTTP 200 to bagby.core.windows.net. I can just double click on this and we can see here's my response. The first thing to note is I got a 200 OK status code. Everything worked out just great. I can go ahead and take a look at the raw um, and we'll see that again there's the 200 OK. You can also see here's my Atom formatted response. So I got a feed and then for each uh, item that I got back I got an entry node and inside of the entry node we've got some you know standard Atom stuff like the title and author etc. And then we get down to where we extended Atom and we return these uh, we return these contents which are of type application WAC XML and they've got a bunch of properties including my partition key, my timestamp, my bottle price, uh, my uh, my wine name, etc. All of the wine specific information. So all of this data was then returned to me. So that's great. I can see how we're able to access uh, access this storage just in general using a tool like this and I understand the, the process. In part two of this screencast I'm going to show you the actual PHP code that takes advantage of this knowledge uses the appropriate PHP libraries to issue the HTTP GET, to do the digital signature, get the data back, and then parse out this XML. So please uh, stay tuned and watch part two of this demo.